Good morning, everyone. My name is Tamara Thorne. I am the symposium host, and I would like to introduce James Shapiro. He will be speaking regarding what can evolutionary biology learn from cancer biology. What can evolutionary biology learn from cancer biology? Usually we put the question the other way around, that evolutionary biology is teaching cancer biology. But at this symposium, we're looking at cancer progression as an active biological process. It's a form of somatic evolution that's gone awry in the cells of our body. And it has two main lessons for evolutionary biology. First, there are distinct classes of multi-site chromosome reorganizations that can happen rapidly in our genomes. And second, those reorganizations result from dedicated biological capabilities present in all eukaryotic cells, and therefore potential sources of evolutionary change. The premise of this symposium is that a fresh look at evolution will help us better understand cancer progression and potentially provide better screening and better treatments. Ignoring the evolutionary perspective can lead us astray as was stated by Aaron Price and Craig in 2013 in their paper on cancer cell immortality. The failure of current cancer treatments to successfully eradicate metastatic disease likely results from a misunderstanding of the natural history of cancer. Rather than seeing malignancy as a consequence of Darwinian microevolution driven by stochastic mutations, it can be considered as the result of a programmed response illicitly accessed by a few key mutations. This program appears to have been imprinted through evolution to cope with DNA damage and stored in the evolutionary memory of the genome. First of all, we need to be clear about what we mean when we use the word evolution. Macroevolution is not the same as microevolution. Microevolution is the gradual evolution by the accumulating independent localized mutations that optimize individual adaptations, as Darwin described it in 1859. Macroevolution, on the other hand, is punctuated evolution, generating new species and new taxa, and it involves chromosome and or karyotype restructuring. Microevolution is much better understood than macroevolution because it's been studied by conventional evolutionary biologists for over a century. The distinction between the two forms of evolutionary change have been known for 80 years since Richard Goldschmidt published The Material Basis of Evolution in 1940. But Goldschmidt has been ignored by conventional evolutionists. Henry Hang, who's speaking later today, has updated this theme in his book, Genome Chaos, that was published last year. Cancer, as we will see, is clearly a disease of macroevolution, often involving large-scale genome reorganizations. We can see how chromosome changes played a major role in the evolution of our own genome. The top of the slide indicates the 17 reconstructed chromosomes color-coded in the ancestor of all vertebrates. At the bottom of the slide, there are the 24 chromosomes in our own genomes, uh, 22 autosomes arranged in order of size from number one to number 22, and then the two sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. The patches of color in our chromosomes show clear homologies to ancestral chromosomes. In between these two sets of chromosomes, there were two whole genome duplications. We know this because there are four copies of the Hox, major histocompatibility and Fox complexes in our genomes. Here's one copy of major histocompatibility, one of Hox, one of the Fox, another major histocompatibility, another Hox complex, and so forth. There are four copies of each of these complexes in our genome and in the genomes of other vertebrates. In our evolution, there were many chromosome fusions that reduced chromosome numbers from 68 to 23, and multiple interchromosomal exchanges that produced the color mixtures you see in our chromosomes. In addition, there the, has been the acquisition of numerous new DNA sequences 
Many of them are repetitive mobile genetic elements, which are the white and gray segments in our chromosomes. Another way to see the role of chromosome structural changes in evolution is to compare human chromosomes with homologous or syntenic, which means on the same thread, regions in the chromosomes of other mammals and a chicken as a, a, a bird example, as shown here. This is on the left is human chromosome one, our largest chromosome, divided into uh, about 50 segments that are rearranged to different genomic locations on various distinct chromosomes in other species. So for example, if we look at this first region of human chromosome one, in the rat and the mouse, it's all on, in one piece on a particular chromosome, five in the rat and four in the mouse. But in the dogs, the same segment is broken up into different pieces. So one this part is on chromosome five in the dog, this part on chromosome two, this part on chromosome 15, we go back to chromosome five and then we go to chromosome six and so forth. So you can see that the uh, chromosomes have been very, re very much rearranged in, in uh, mammalian evolution, and especially with respect to birds, which also lack part of the, the uh, DNA sequences that are present in chromosome one. Cellular geneticists have known for over a century that genome rearrangements are common in cancer cells. DNA sequencing has focused attention more sharply on the basic processes of genome change in cancer. In 2011, Stevens et al. published early results of whole cancer genome sequencing. Many cancers consisted of clones of cells with multiple shared chromosome modifications suggesting they occurred, as the title of their paper says, in a single catastrophic event. This shot slide shows circus plots of four human cancer genomes. And in a circus plot, the human chromosomes are arranged around this, the circle. So here's chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, chromosome four, and so forth until we get to chromosome 22, and then the X and the Y chromosome. The chromosome rearrangements are indicated by the colored lines. So the orange ones indicate mostly interchromosomal inter exchanges. But the dark blue lines present in all four genomes indicate intrachromosomal rearrangements. Uh, for example, in this colorectal cancer uh, image, 239 rearrangements of chromosome 15, only chromosome 15, are present in this region here. Uh, in this thyroid cancer genome, there are 77 rearrangements on the short arm of chromosome 9. And in this cancer, lung cancer cell line, there are 85 copy number variations on chromosome 8. So these rearrangements, uh, uh, all four uh, cancer genomes, indicate clustered exchanges on individual chromosomes. This characteristic pattern of individual chromosomes chromosome fragmentation and reassembly is known as chromothripsis, which literally, liter literally means chromosome shattering. Stevens et al. also published other cancer genomes displaying a very different pattern of multiple catastrophic chromosome changes. Instead of the full set of 23 chromosomes around the circle, these three plots only include three or five different restructured chromosomes for each cancer. Numerous colored lines indicate multiple connected, or as the term is chained, breakpoint exchanges between just those few particular chromosomes, with many fewer breakpoints occurring on the same chromosome. These multiple linked interchromosomal exchanges are called chromoplexy, which means chromosome weaving, and it's very different from chromothripsis. What does the difference between chromothripsis and chromoplexy mean? We have just seen two distinct signature patterns for dozens to hundreds of multi-site chromosome rearrangements in cancer that involve only a small set between one and five of the 23 human chromosomes. Why is that significant? 
the involvement of only a small part of the karyotype in these multiple exchanges tells us that they are highly non-random in the genome. Hence, they are the products of organized cell biological activity and not due to multiple accidents. If they were accidentally, they would be distributed among all the chromosomes in a probabilistic fashion. The fact that there are at least two different signatures, and there are in fact several more, is evidence for the existence of more than one evolved, complex, four-dimensional cellular repair system capable of generating such clustered, distinctive, and highly non-random rearrangements. This brings us to our first cancer biology lesson for evolutionary biology. Cancer cells restructure their genomes at key punctuations in evolution to acquire new traits, such as malignancy, metastasis, chemo and chemotherapy resistance. The underlying massive genome restructuring can happen suddenly, executed by evolutionarily conserved cellular routines, acting abruptly at multiple genome sites, as in chromotrypsis and chromoplexy. What do we currently know about the cell processes that trigger karyotype reorganization? And the reference at the bottom is there mostly because of the title, emphasizing that cancer is evolution within a lifetime. We now know that one trigger for chromothripsis and other complex genome changes in cancer is a cell division error that leaves a lagging chromosome or chromosome fragment unattached to the mitotic spindle. Such a lagging chromosome at, at cell division ends up in one daughter cell encased in a micronucleus, which we can see in this uh, figure. Here's the main cell nucleus, and here's this micronucleus in red next to it containing a single lagging chromosome, which didn't uh, separate properly in mitosis. When a cell with, mic with a micronucleus undergoes division, the encased chromosome shatters late in the cell cycle during the initial stages of mitosis. Then the fragments replicate their DNA, which is indicated by green fluorescence in this figure, and transmitted and, and continues replica replicating as they are transmitted unequally to the two daughter cells as shown in this video. Post division, the partially replicated fragments can be joined into chromatopsis products. And since they've been replicated, there are multiple copies of certain segments, and there will be copy number variations. The fact that micronuclei are also found in plants associated with DNA damage repair and with micro, uh, chromothripsis means that this micronuclei have a deep history in, in eukaryotic evolution and the processes of genome change. Chromothripsis, the chromothripsis video showed that fragmentation and replication of micronuclear chromosomes occurs late in the cell cycle during mitotic division. That's not indicated really very well in this figure, but this is supposed to indicate chromothripsis on top. Chromoplexy, in contrast, occurs during interphase at an earlier stage of the cell cycle. Chromoplexy involves multiple exchanges between a small subset of chromosomes without replication or copy number variations. The interchanges ex indicate that the chromosomes must have been physically grouped together in the nucleus. And this kind of chromosome clustering occurs in transcription factories earlier in the cell cycle during interphase genome expression. We are confident in assigning chromoplexy to interphase because there are connections between the sites of interchromosomal exchange and known chromosome associations during transcription during interphase. A completely different source of complex chromosome changes involves the formation of non-mitotic polyploid giant cancer cells after cell fusions or stress, such as chemotherapy. The top row shows normal cell division in a cancer cell as we're accustomed to seeing with uh, uh, separation of the chromosomes uh, at, 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 uh, in, in mitosis, division and, and segregation, and equal segregation into the two daughter cells. So that's a normal mitosis. The bottom two rows show nuclear growth due to genome endoreplication in a non-dividing 
polyploid giant cancer cell that finally splits apart in a multipolar fashion to de generate smaller cells. Many of these progeny cells are not viable, but some can have pseudodiploid rearranged genomes and may form a new, more aggressive tumor. This figure, by the way, comes, these figures, by the way, come from the laboratory of Jin Song Yu, who was talking on Friday in this symposium. Let's follow the history of that polyploid giant cancer cell in this video, with nuclear growth followed by a multipolar cell division, which can lead to massive chromosome rearrangements. The green fluorescence labels the microtubules, and the red fluorescence labels the histones, which is where the surrounding the, the genomic DNA. So here's the polyploid giant cell. This, the DNA in the nucleus is undergoing what's called endo-replication. And uh, now the cell is beginning to compress and it will suddenly divide. And you can see that unlike normal mitosis, this is a multipolar division producing cells which have different numbers of, different numbers of chromosomes and those chromosomes can be multiply rearranged. Polyploidy and endoreplication are an ancient eukaryotic cell response. Stresses that lead to polyploid cell formation include telomere damage in the first reference, uh, which often leads to chromosome fusions, chromosome bridges, and chromosome breakage in mitosis, senescence or cell aging, as in the Aaron Prize and Craig paper from 2013, uh, radiation which breaks cr uh, chromosomes, and very interestingly, wounding of the tissue, physical wounding of the tissue. And this is a paper about Drosophila, but it points out that the same process goes on in mammals as conservation of the signaling networks. And as we'll see shortly, uh, mammalian cells have polyploid responses to, to damage as well. Polyploidy in plants is a generalized response to stress, which again indicates that the polyploid response to stress has deep roots in eukaryotic evolution. The clinical significance of the polyploid response to healing was recognized already by Theodore Bovary a pioneer of cytogenetics in 1914, when he published a, a paper called Concerning the Origin of Malignant Tumors. And in that paper, he wrote the following. One would therefore have to assume that the generation of a malignant tumor as a result of injury takes place in two stages that may be separated from each other by a lengthy interval. The first stage would be the inhibition of cytoplasmic partitioning due to an insult that occurs when the cell is in the process of dividing. This produces the tetraploidy. The second step, however, would be a stimulus that induces the tetraploid cell to divide by multiple, multipolar mitosis, as we just saw. So it, it, there are two life history events which are involved in this case in making a skin cancer cell. This idea might perhaps provide an explanation for certain specific observations that have been made in the field of tumor research. It has frequently been noted that carcinomas of the skin arise in scars, especially scars resulting from burns, that the scars are often present long before the carcinoma develops, and that injury to the scar strongly favors the emergence of the tumor. There is uh, potential significance today also in, in, of the polyploid giant cancer cells. Uh, as Niu et al. point out, polyploid giant cells may offer novel therapeutic opportunities by providing new molecular targets for treatment, such as the HIPPO and JNK signaling networks involved in polyploid cell formation, as was indicated in the previous slide. In summary, we have provided strong evidence for the existence of a giant cell cycle that may constitute a generalized mechanism for survival and generation of genomically altered tumor initiating cells that contribute to the disease relapse. Defining the molecular mechanisms that regulate the giant cell cycle should offer novel opportunities for therapeutic intervention for this dev devastating disease.
And uh, all this work on polyploid giant cancer cells that I've shown you comes from the laboratory of Jin Song Yu, who is going to be talking on Friday. So this brings us to the second lesson uh, the cancer biology holds for evolutionary biology. Somatic eukaryotic cells have evolved responses to mitotic failure and stress, like micronuclei and polyploidy, that induce major genome reorganizations. Activating genome-wide responses would help explain rapid evolutionary radiations found after stress and catastrophic events such as mass extinctions. If correct, the genome cataclysms must occur in the germline. How likely is it that the germ germline mitotic failure and genome restructuring actually occurs? It turns out that we already know the answer to the, that question. Shortly after chromothripsis was first described in cancer, examples were found in, in the human germline. And here's the 2011 paper on chromothripsis in the human germline. Here are three of many other papers describing chromothripsis occurring in the human germline, causing uh, sometimes inherited diseases, sometimes without uh, 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 phenotype. The kinds of rapid genome restructurings we have been discussing are not exceptional. Complementary observations about rapid genome change are widespread and indicate that the kinds of genome changes observed in cancer can also occur in organismal evolution. A distinct pattern of focal localized copy number variations called chromoanasynthesis has been documented in nematode worms. That's the first reference. Chromothripsis involving micronuclei occurs in plants where the germline emerges from somatic cells. So this second reference is about chromothripsis in plants. Even basic eukaryotes like a fungus undergo extensive and rapid chromosome restructuring, as indicated in the third reference. And both chromoplexy and chromoanasynthesis occur in the human germline as well as in cancer cells. Chromoplexy and chromoanasynthesis have all been aggregated under the general term of chromoanagenesis, and as Pellistor and Gatineau state, have become part of the macroevolution scenario. It, and polyploidy, which we've seen as a trigger for chromosome genome rearrangement, is increasingly recognized as a source of adaptive useful genome variability in yeast and plants as indicated by these references. So here's polyploidy derives rapid adaptation in yeast, polyploidy in genome evolution in plants and so forth. Darwin wrote in 1859, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find out no such case. That's from chapter six of The Origin of Species. But based on what we've seen in cancer and what these papers tell us is going on in plant evolution and in, in yeast adapt adaptations, is there really any question that what we have learned about eukaryotes' capacity for rapid genome reorganization has to be front and center in thinking about how major evolutionary change occurs? Thank you. So with that, um, I think we have had a second absolutely fascinating talk by, by Jim Shapiro. Um, thank you very much for Jim for, uh, for highlighting and, and educating many of us on, on the role of, uh, of polyploid giant cancer cells. I know we'll hear more about them from a number of speakers throughout the event. It is really remarkable how long they had been neglected or perhaps misunderstood as simply not viable and therefore as not important to pay attention to. And now we are discovering or rediscovering how they play a very crucial role in, in the adaptation of cancer. And in fact, maybe, may, may some, some even may be referring to them as cancer, as perhaps as the cancer stem cells uh, that are so crucial in surviving therapy and then spawning therapy resistance and 
invasiveness and so on. Um, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, most of the questions from the chat were really just, so to speak, great support for the talks by Azra and by, by Jim. Um, and um, again, if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat room. We'll try to give them to the speakers um, with a strong support that has come in so far, but no specific questions. I'll ask a question, Jim. Uh, can you maybe give a couple of other examples from your book or from your recent reviews on, on what I would call traditional biological organismal evolution of unicellular or multicellular organisms, if you like, rather than in the cancer field specifically um, of your natural genetic engineering or NGE of which you've cited so many uh, empirical and, and, and well-proven uh, examples, both from experiments and from the DNA record of evolution, perhaps cite a few examples. Right, well, as, as I've been studying cancer cells and their ability to change their genomes, am I coming through? Yes, very good. Um, I've been amazed at learning uh, all of the ways that cells both can make these large scale rearrangements, but also generate totally new uh, DNA sequences and two totally new DNA structures. So, for example, in the processes that lead to chromotrypsis, uh, a DNA polymerase is used to make some of the rearrangements called polymerase theta, which makes which joins together uh, sequences which only share microhomologies, and also adds additional nucleotides, so that totally new functions are are involved. And if that goes on in cancer, it's hard to imagine that it, it's, it's something very new in, in the human genome or in mammals, but that it's uh, likely to be a very basic process in evolution. And so uh, I've been uh, very much surprised by finding out all of these uh, sources of new genome sequences, which can add, sometimes be mistaken for localized mutations, but in fact are part of the genome restructuring process. Yeah. yeah, it is absolutely fascinating how, of course, the study of organismal evolution, if you like, has played a significant role in helping understand cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. But it is even it is equally remarkable how the understanding of cancer evolution is now informing and giving new hints and, and new examples to how historical billions of years of biological organismal evolution has worked. And it is reinforcing uh, many of the concepts that you and, and, and many others have, uh, have, uh, have explained and, and, and have pointed out where indeed uh, punctuated evolution at the, at the gene genome level is occurring. Um, well, yeah, I think one of the major points is that, uh, was in the title of that paper, uh, Genome is Evolution Within a Lifetime. If cancer cells can become so restructured as they do especially after they've been through a number of challenges like chemotherapy. Um, uh, it's clear that we don't need eons of time for biological evolution. That can happen very rapidly as well. As we've seen in the Cambrian, and of course, as we now, I think it's a term Ken Pienta has used, and I want to steal his thumber, thunder for his presentation, as we will see that they are cancer Cambrian events, you've described some of them, he uses that terminology, but it does explain or at least provide strong suggestions of how rapid organismal evolution has worked, uh, something that we've observed in both in the fossil and now more and more in the DNA record. 